Good morning or good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us this morning um, or this afternoon for this uh, town hall meeting of the BCRSP. I'm going to pass it over now to uh, the chair of the board, Monica Zabo. Monica? Perfect. Thank you so much. And uh, just echoing uh, Nikki's remarks, uh, thank you for everyone for joining us today. It's a bit of a new reality, I'm sure, for many of you. Um, that we're uh, working from a remote area or from home and um, meeting through other means. Um, it's kind of taught us a bit of a, a great lesson that uh, it's actually doable and we've had some great participation. So it's something that we will continue to do to help us in connecting with our certificates across the country. All right, next slide, please, Stuart. So just to give everyone a, a bit of an update on, um, on what's happening with the office as a result of, of COVID-19 and, and what kind of impact that it's had. So we have had the BCRSP office team, we work working remotely since March 16th. Um, we've also canceled all receptions and trade shows and any presentations that have been in person through until June. And we're actually looking into June as well and keeping an eye on recommendations that are made from the experts on whether we move forward with those. So we have uh, transitioned into making all of our committee meetings uh, switch to virtual platforms. And one of the other things that has been impacted is the June CRSP examination, which was currently scheduled for June 15th to 26th. So we are working very closely with our provider, which is Pearson View, um, and not a big surprise, but currently most physical centers are closed as per mandates by the government um, because they are deemed as non-essential services. Um, and currently this is the case through April 30th. Um, but we will be extending the writing um, opportunity for candidates who may be unable to test in June and uh, candidates have been notified of this information so that they can um, make the appropriate decisions given their circumstances. Next slide, please. Oops, Stuart. Oh, it is, well, that one looked very similar to the last one. I didn't notice that it switched up. <laughs> um, and those, uh, those um, this, the certification maintenance points deadline has been extended to May 30th for those that are um, required to submit this year. So that extension will also apply to the completion of the equivalency modules um, for those that have um, uh, had a requirement to get those equivalency mo modules done. So we have extended those to give everyone a little bit of flexibility and breathing space. Um, the governing board is looking at options. We do have a governing board meeting in June um, and we will be looking at, and I'll talk a little bit about that, whether that will be virtual or in person, we will make a decision on that at the end of the month. Um, but we will discuss the future options for continuous professional development cycles. And we're looking at things like lifting maximum points permit, permitted under specific sections like attending webinar, webinars or self-directed learning, um, just to give a little bit more flexibility since uh, many of the events that we would all be attending in the next little while have been canceled. So we will make sure we keep an eye on that um, and, and flip you any information when we see those kind of virtual learning opportunities come up. And we are also looking at a special point category for reflective learning submissions on COVID-19. So basically, if you've been doing any work around that, um, any self-development or learning around how to deal with pandemics or emergency response, um, we'll have a special point category so that you can uh, use that, those activities um, for your maintenance points. The governing board meeting was, is, is still scheduled for June 27th to 28th, um, and we were planning on meeting in Nova Scotia. Um, but we will be looking at this again at the end of April to see if it is appropriate for us to do that. And in the meantime, in the background, we are looking at uh, sort of virtual options on how we can manage that in case um, it's not prudent to actually hold a face-to-face -face meeting. And we have decided to make the annual general meeting, which was scheduled or is scheduled for June 29th, um, that we will be holding that virtually and we will be sending out all the certificates more information specific to that um, in early May. 
and I'll hand over to a presentation to Kevin. Good morning or afternoon to everybody. Um, um, basically, we wanted to also take this opportunity to update uh, certificates with some of the things that we've been doing over the past year or so. And one of the things that perhaps is of, of greater interest, particularly to those of you in the West, is this whole idea of uh, professionalization, what that means, and where, that, where the overall concept from our perspective has come from. So this really goes back to discussions we've had for quite some time over trying to move the uh, practice of occupational health and safety in Canada into what we would consider to be a normal career progression. Um, and away from something that as we've sort of grown over time, initially we were sort of the an add-on type of thing or, or perhaps something that was an add-on to a supervisor's duties or to somebody else in an office environment uh, who was w given the opportunity or, or basically took on the role of being the safety person. It's our firm belief that we've progressed considerably since then and we are now at a stage where we need to look at it as a, a proper career. So what does that mean? Well, basically to have a career, you obviously have to have a career path. And what you see on the screen in front of you is our visualization of what that means in this context. So you basically come into the process, whether it be because you're changing career part way or because you are, were assigned certain duties and you thought I had an interest of it, or perhaps because you decided even in high school that you've decided that health and safety is something that you'd like to become or make a career. What we're saying now is that we are at a stage where you really need to have a formal path for this. And that formal path really means formal academic, training, formal work experience, and also some form of, form of certification along the way, whether that be a CRST or a CRSP, or as you progress even further, perhaps some specialist uh, certifications. And it also means that you will perhaps uh, move into research, which is something that in Canada we haven't really done that much of. So if we want to get there, we have to start defining what we mean by a profession. And unfortunately in Canada, the word profession or professional is something that's somewhat overused. Next slide, please, Stuart. So to start from the beginning, we decided we, we got to have a definition. This, the definition that we've adopted is actually uh, one that we borrowed from Australia. And basically to hold yourself out as a professional, you have to be, first of all, a recognized group or a group of individuals. You have to have a certain uh, ethical adherence to standards. And you also have to have something that defines you as a professional, whether that be special, special knowledge skills, uh, and you get those skills through a, uh, a recognized body of learning or academics. And that, that body of, of learning actually forms because of research, education, and training at a high level. And the people who actually apply that are the professionals. Next slide, please. Defining that in a slightly different way is basically what we've been working on for the last two and a half years. So you start with this body of knowledge or domains of practice. So this is the practice of health and safety. Once you know what that practice is, you develop educational programs to actually teach practitioners what they need to know from a formal academic perspective. You also need to define the role and the capability of each people of, of individuals within that uh, area of practice. So you also develop things like career paths, which is what I just showed a second ago. But you also talk about the skill sets and the scopes of practice. 
And the, uh, el the ultimate end goal of all of this is to move yourself towards professional status. And that usually means either title recognition or in the longer term, it means a regulatory recognition through licensure and the establishment of a college or something similar to that. The other point I should make is that the college is something that is there to protect the public, not necessarily the practice. To move this along, we've, we, we realized early on that we needed to have a, an organized framework to do this. And working with, uh, as a joint project with the CSSE, we've developed um, what most of you hopefully have seen is what we call the National Framework for Health and Safety Practice in Canada. And the reason why we feel that this is quite important to have this framework is because we feel that while you may have slight differences from different jurisdictions across Canada, the core of the profession and how you apply the, that profession, how you apply the knowledge, how you apply the standards needs to have a standardized framework, particularly in light of, of the way that Canada operates within a global environment, but also interprovincially where people work across provincial boundaries and provincial jurisdictions. So it basically gives you a system of organization of what that looks like. As I said, it started as a BCRSP, uh, uh, sorry, a, a joint project between the BCRSP and the CSSE. And it now is, has gotten to the stage where we think we actually have it nailed down and we need to bring in other groups that would form part of this. Because we clearly recognize that from a board perspective, we may be the certifying body for uh, the health and safety generalist but for, um, uh, for others, particularly those who are in more in the specialist role, they also have similar roles to play and it, they need to have input to this process. Next slide, please. So this is the actual framework that we've talked about. It's been widely disseminated, hopefully, and, and most of you would have seen this. Um, so, I would urge you all to have a look at that because it, it clearly says that everybody has a role to play. And while you'll have certain provincial aspects of it, such as a, a regulatory college within a provincial jurisdiction, you'll also have roles for certifying bodies like the BCRSP, for membership organizations like the CSSE, for academic institutions indirectly, and a way to govern those academic institutions or not so much govern them, but govern their output. And that's where the accreditation model comes from. And also an opportunity to bring all of this together under one umbrella group that would have input from all of the constituent parts. So this, this is where we've been spending a lot of our time in the past little while, uh, particularly say in the last year and a half. We've also been busy in some, some other areas and Dave Johnson, the current vice chair, will take it from there. Hey, thanks, Kevin. And uh, thank you everybody for taking the time uh, to attend this presentation. Uh, as Monica noted, this is something of a new normal. I think a lot of us are working like this and uh, it's uh, it's got its challenges to be sure, and uh, also wanted to say thank you for those of you who are taking time out from what quite potentially is a very busy day. I know myself; it's this is probably the busiest I've been for a long time, and uh, it's been uh, like I said, very very challenging. So let's move on to the first slide, please. Thank you. So. The, uh, what I'll be talking about is building on what Kevin just discussed, and, and this is about what the board is doing to turn that concept and that vision into reality through some of the more tangible and pragmatic things that we're doing. So very quickly, I'll review the four pillars that uh, the board subscribes to, and these are very important 
and I'll be going into a little bit more depth on each of these pillars, but very important that we have these because this is how we maintain our vision as we go from year to year and we don't get distracted by other things going on around us like COVID-19 and those kinds of things. We want to have a steady course and to achieve the goals and objectives that we're working towards. So the first one, of course, is developing the capability of the health and safety profession. Um, the second pillar is advocacy. And uh, this is something relatively new for BCRSP. This is uh, not an area that we have a lot of experience in, and so we're learning, but we're also making great progress. Engagement, of course, is, uh, we'll talk about that, but again, I think everybody these days uses the word engagement more and more. We all know how important uh, participation and involvement of all stakeholders is as we move forward. And then operational excellence, and that is about making sure the organization continues to operate at its uh, peak performance as much as possible. So if we can go to the next, thank you. So our key initiatives around each of these four pillars. The first one we talked about was our capability. And um, this is a, a big part of this is about our strategic partnership with CSSE with a focus on accreditation of colleges and university programs. And uh, if you recall what Kevin just discussed, there was this, you know, this whole issue about the linkage between experience and education and moving the profession forward. And if you think about other professions, this is quite normal for engineers and uh, medical people and a lot of other people um, that the educational institutions that provide courses and uh, instruction in the subject matter are actually go through an accreditation process uh, established by that professional body. And you, there's a definition there. I think everybody can read that. So what we're working on, and we're in the very early stages of this, is how would we accredit universities, colleges, and others so that when somebody does write the CRST exam or the CRST exam, that they are uh, have graduated from one of these accredited schools. Um, not to get too excited, this is probably going to take years before we get there, but uh, this is the direction where we really want to move it, and we need to move in that direction if, in fact, the uh, OHS profession is to truly become a recognized profession. I want to point out here that currently we are looking for volunteers. And uh, if you're interested, please go to the BCRSP website and put your name in the hat. And uh, it would be a great, great experience and it'd be something uh, for somebody's legacy to leave behind. Uh, this is, I think, really uh, important work to move the profession forward. So the next slide, please. The next one, of course, is the capability in growing the certification offerings. Um, I, I'm pretty sure most people, um, maybe everybody on this call is aware of this, that we did introduce the CRST for uh, people who are um, more on the practitioner side of things. And I'm not gonna go into all the details about it, but really, it is to work on towards differentiating between the uh, the technician side of the business versus the professional side of the business, and um, there's potentially other opportunities when we look around the world and we talk to other like organizations. We see, for instance, that there. Uh, is a, a higher level, um, whether you call it a leadership level or something like that, is yet to be determined. But um, typically, the educational requirements are much higher, in, and so is the experience, and so is the uh, the uh, expectations of that person. And if you're interested, there's a great document out there uh, called the Singapore Accord, and associated by associated with Inchco. And in it, there's a, a, a comparison between what each of these levels would be expected to be able to demonstrate. Uh, but certainly, 
this is an area that uh, BCRSP is very interested in pursuing. The uh, CRST uh, so far has been quite successful and we're going to continue to uh, promote that as much as we can. And I think it fills a gap that uh, was there and there was a demand for it. So uh, we'll, we'll continue to monitor it and report back to the certificates as to how well we're doing on that. So next slide. Advocacy. As I mentioned earlier, this is uh, a somewhat new experience for BCRSP. This is not, we never really saw this as a, a core requirement. We always thought maybe somebody else would do this, but it became increasingly important that uh, the, uh, the board had a responsibility to do this because quite frankly, the BCRSP is probably one of the largest uh, organizations in Canada representing safety professionals. And uh, so to do that, we've been having a variety of meetings with key stakeholders. We've been meeting with government, we've been meeting with labor groups, employer groups, and others to get the word out there about um, our existence and the need for uh, when uh, an organization is hiring a safety professional that they really ought to be hiring somebody with a, a certificate in that field. And it's been quite surprising how few people actually are aware of the existence of the, uh, the CRSP or the CST designation. So a lot of work to do there in, in that area. The other thing that we're also doing while we're getting the word out is also looking for opportunities where we can be recognized in established regulations or regulations that are being amended. And, you know, uh, many of you are aware that oftentimes whether federal legislation, provincial legislation, they may say, you know, this has to be done by a qualified person or this has to be done by a professional engineer. So if we're under federal legislation that says qualified person, we may want to see that a qualified person in a holder of a CRSP or a CRST, depending on the circumstances, that would be an example of that. But we continue to look for those kinds of opportunities where legislation will recognize the uh, importance of uh, certificates capabilities. And then in the last one, it's to work on how do we prove to government, how do we prove to employers that when you hire uh, qualified safety professionals, and by qualified safety professionals, I'm talking about those of us who possess a CRSP, that when you hire somebody with that level of knowledge and expertise and competency, that you will get better performance. I certainly believe that. Um, I know my own staff, I do require all of them to uh, have a CRSP, either we hire them with it or we give them two years in which to acquire it, but um, and, uh, and certainly I know where I'm working, we have some pretty strong evidence to show that when you employ professionals, they are much more effective, much more efficient, and get much better results. But having said that, we're looking for others who have that similar experience to please step up and uh, contact uh, BCRSP and let us know your story so we can add to that. And we can use that when we're speaking to our stakeholders and convincing them that this is something that they really need to consider. There is, as you probably know, a good growing body of evidence to show that those organizations that are the safest are also the most profitable. So what we need to be able to do is help explain, well, how do you get to be the safest and the most profitable and one of those factors will be the hiring of qualified safety professionals. Okay. And engagement. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, engagement, I think we all recognize the need, uh, you know, if you're familiar with ISO 45,000, even it'll tell you that you need to have work group participation and everything. And we're doing the same thing. And as I mentioned earlier, INCHCO, we're working very closely with them. We are working with other countries, uh, similar organizations, and they, we have an MOU with uh, the US-based CSP, uh, uh, BCSB, and uh, 
also with Australia and some other uh, parts of the world. This is really, really important that we have this kind of collaboration with the international uh, component because that'll help build our uh, story about why it's so important. And, you know, we start seeing better performance in other parts of the world, maybe because they have more stringent requirements for uh, the employment of safety professionals. So we're looking for that. At a national level, as Kevin mentioned earlier, we're working very closely with CSSE and we've issued joint communications a national framework that Kevin covered. And uh, as we advertised here, we're looking for uh, people again to talk about accreditation. And so please go to the website and check for that. And then other projects. I do want to say this, this has been a, something of a personal issue for me that in Canada, we as safety professionals really need to start speaking with one voice and uh, we, you know, and be consistent not to undermine each other and so on. Because right now we are fragmented and uh, with that fragmentation, um, others will fill the vacuum uh, and uh, we lose out on that. So very, very important. This is what we're working on is we need CSSC and its members and all the people in BCRC all speaking with one voice and uh, getting that message out there to strengthen this profession. And then the other area where we're working on engagement is working with, uh, they talk about building our circle of influence. Um, I know at work our legal people refer to it as the ecosystem, but uh, we are very closely associated with Threads of Life, Skills Canada, Minerva. We support them financially in some cases. We support them uh, through uh, having partnerships with them. And uh, again, it's all about getting the word out there that we're all part of one uh, or one group of people all moving in the same direction to improve safety for uh, everybody. Okay. Well, and then operational excellence, and I believe this is our last pillar. And I talked about this earlier, how important it is to maintain a vision. So we stick to this and to help us make sure that we don't go astray. We have a very strong enterprise risk management program. We review all of our risks every meeting. We adjust them as times things change. And I would say it's working extremely well. And uh, we've been able to achieve a lot because we've been managing these risks. Then as we move forward into 2020, the one of the things that we've been uh, maybe deficient in is that we never really had uh, specific measurable goals. We had goals that were um, there. There's no question about a lot of the goals we had, but they're not quantitative goals. Like we might say, oh, well, you know, we want to increase the number of certificates by a thousand people per year or something like that. That's fine, but then we need to make sure we balance that with something so that we don't start compromising our standards and to achieve those goals. So that's the purpose of a balanced scorecard. So we're going to be working that on that in 2020 and identifying some of the very key strategic goals that we need to work for. But those, but we need to make sure we've got uh, counterbalances to it that, so that we don't sacrifice one part of the organization to improve the other. So, so it's going to take a bit of work, but I think it's going to really uh, end up with a, a much improved uh, approach to these things. Um, and then, of course, the, looking at the competency matrix of the Board of Governors and uh, how the board operates, and we'll be making some changes to the bylaws at the AGM on the uh, terms and roles of the executive officers. And I think I'm done. Yes, I am. Over to you, Monica. Now, I was talking to myself, so I'm not going to thank so much, Dave. Um, so the next little bit is actually in the spirit of, of really about engagement and building relationships and something that I'm very passionate about for the BCRSP is to 
increase our amount of communications. We've heard from certificates that they don't always feel like they are a, a part of BCRSP or hear much from us. So we're really trying to increase that and make sure that we're communicating um, more often and as well in different ways. So we have, just to give you a sense of what we've done around this, we've increased the frequency of our email communications um, so that you receive more frequent updates. And um, we are always looking for other opportunities to either attend events or receptions or, as Dave was mentioning, to work with our partners and our um, those organizations that we've had relationships with. And it's really to, uh, to let them know what we do, um, but also to um, provide that opportunity for people to talk and exchange ideas and build those relationships. Um, we've actually, just to give you a bit of a summary, we've had connector town hall events in Toronto, Calgary, Edmonton, Banff, Winnipeg, Sudbury, and we also uh, co-hosted a um, Canadian reception at the last uh, Canadian Society for Safety um, Engineering conference, conference, sorry, and also at the American version of that conference. Um, and we are always looking for opportunities to present. So if there are any conferences or events where we can, or we think we can promote the certification where we know that um, there will either be uh, those, those um, that are interested in, in getting certified or those that might employ certificates or um, just be interested in, um, in the opportunity around how they, uh, how they actually get into our, our, uh, our line of work. Um, so just to again give you a sense of that, in 2019 we presented at 10 different events and participated in 16 different trade shows. And again, just to promote the certification and talk to those about the value of, of being certified as well as employing a certificate. So if there's any other forums that you haven't seen us at or if there's anything that you would recommend, we'd love to hear from you because um, we are always looking at more forums to engage in conversations, not only with certificates, um, but those that might be um, interested in getting certified or employing certificates as well. And I'm sure this is great news for everyone. I've heard um, a bit of feedback on our website. So we are working on a, a refresh and that project is in the works. So stay tuned, we'll be looking for um, a refreshed website soon. Thanks, Stuart. Um, so just to give you a bit of a sense of our numbers, uh, by at the year end of 2019, there were 54 active CRSTs um, and the March 2020 exam results are pending release. And for um, CRSPs, there are just over 5,700 active CRSPs and um, 80 new CRSPs and there were three reinstatements just released recently. To give you a sense of the Canadian Registered Safety Technicians by province, um, it looks like Alberta, BC, Ontario, and Saskatchewan have um, sort of the, the larger numbers, but we are almost being, uh, like we're almost in each of the provinces. So um, I, we are very happy with the uptake on the CRST. Um, examination and certification and we continue to to promote that and if you know anyone that um, is more on the technical side of things and likes to be more hands-on please let them know that we do have that certification available next slide and for CRSPs as I mentioned there's just over 5700 um, CRSPs um, in as of the end of 2019 And that, that ended just like that on me. So I wanted to uh, now open up the opportunity for anyone that's joined us on this uh, webinar to ask any questions. And I'll hand it over to, uh, to Nikki to let everyone know how they can do that. Yeah, thank you, Monica. So there's two ways you can ask questions. Uh, there is a uh, Q&A uh, little icon that you'll see on your screen that you can type in a question and we will uh, go through each question and answer them. But you can also raise your hand. Um, and uh, if I see your hand raised, I will um, unmute you to allow you to uh, speak. Um, so I have uh, uh, one question that had come in while we were presenting. Um, and the question is, any advice for someone applying to the CRSP in 2021. Um, 
So I'm not sure if Monica, you want to take that one or if you want Kevin to handle it as chair of QRC. I just to, just quickly, it's, it's yep. about being, and Kevin, please do uh, chime in, but it's about being organized, making sure you have all the documentation that's required all together. Um, and um, so it's a lot of work from your end at the beginning to collect all the information that you need, but it's, it really makes it a smoother process, right? If you have all of your packets together before submitting. Is there anything else, Kevin, that you would recommend? Uh, not really. I, one of the things that we have noticed, um, particularly now that we've gone to the online application process, is mm -hmm. that it, 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 in some ways it's easier because it sort of leads you through and you can't go to the next step unless you've completed the previous one. Um, uh, the other thing, of course, is that now it's more a question of, you know, now that we've sort of standardized with respect to academics, etc., those parts are sort of relatively easily to easy to compete or complete. You either have it or you don't. What's perhaps a little bit more challenging is determining whether or not you have uh, the equivalent of four years professional level practice. And it's sometimes difficult for certificates or applicants to understand the difference between four years experience, i.e. I've been working in the field for four years, and what we're actually looking for, which is four years of experience at a professional level. The two are not necessarily synonymous. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, so we have uh, a question um, from uh, Sean Foley, and I'm going to unmute your line, Sean, so you can ask your question. Sean, you're unmuted. Awesome. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, just a general question. I'm relatively new, uh, actually, as a CRSP, and this is my first town hall meeting I've attended. Uh, just kind of around communications um, and that topic, does the CRSP currently I'm not sure if we do this or the BCRSP, sorry, offer any like regional, local meetups or get togethers for other CRSPs in, you know, the region or town you're in um, for just a chance to get together and kind of mull over ideas or just have that open communication and sharing of ideas and chatting. I'm not sure if you guys offer this, but it might be certain value in that. Yeah, I, I can answer that, Sean. This is Nikki. Um, so that's the idea behind the BCRSP Connect events. Um, so we do have um, typically anywhere from four to six events in a year uh, at different places across the country. So we, we try to move it around um, to cover the different regions, um, but we're not necessarily in every region every year. Unfortunately, uh, we had several events planned through the spring that have all, of course, been canceled um, oh, okay. for an obvious reason so um, we you know for this year it's hard to, to say at this point um, we haven't started to look at fall dates um, to, to commit to anything yet but you know we'll be monitoring what happens with COVID-19 and and the advisories from government and and we'll look to do uh, some events in the fall if it is safe and prudent to do so yeah, it's, it's Kevin Dawson here also. I just add to that as well to, to clarify the difference or to perhaps reiterate the difference between the role of the BCRSP as a certifying body and the role of a membership organization such as CSSE in the sense that really the fundamental role, our fundamental role is to, to certify people. It's not necessarily to take over some of the activities that you would normally expect from uh, a membership body such as, as CSSE. In other words, the, the networking and the continuous professional education, all that kind of stuff, really that belongs more in the membership rail, realm. Thank you. You're welcome, Sean. Okay, so we have a question from uh, Ryan in Saskatchewan. Uh, he is asking uh, what Monica meant by reinstatement. So again, I can answer this question if, if you want me to, Monica. Okay, so uh, this is referring to the numbers that Monica just shared in terms of the number of uh, new CRSPs that passed the February exam. There were three reinstatements. So 
the policy is that if you have held a CRSP uh, in the past and for whatever reason um, you have relinquished your CRSP for a period of uh, more five years or longer, um, in most cases it's due to someone either not completing their CPD requirement or not paying their annual renewal fee. Those are the two main reasons why people lose their certification. Um, after a five year period of being in that non-compliant state, uh, you can reinstate your certification by rewriting the CRSP exam. So because you've held your CRSP previously, you don't have to go through the whole uh, application process. There's a, a direct to exam route for reinstatement purposes, uh, but you do need to pass. So those three individuals were individuals that had had their certification revoked uh, for one of those reasons and uh, rewrote the exam and were successful and now their certification is being reinstated to them. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, and we have a question from Stephen, uh, I believe in BC. Um, he's asking that is the CRST not a stepping to stone to the CRSP or is a thought now it is a different stream? If so, what is the difference between the two? Uh, so Kevin, do you maybe want to tackle that one? Okay. Um, if you would cast your mind back to the slide, we talked about the, the, uh, the sort of the career path thing. Well, in one, in some ways, the, the this is one of these yes and no answers. The, the CRST and the CRSP are independent in one way, but they complement each other. So the intent behind it is that the CRST is predominantly those pra people who are uh, at, at the practitioner level, perhaps, well, we're all practitioners, but who are actually, their scope of practice is more hands-on field, technical level um, uh, activities, as opposed to the professional level practitioner who would be the individual more involved in the management of programs, development of programs, and that kind of thing. So they are not exclusive. Um, they do sort of overlap, but they're aimed at two different, uh, fundamentally different activities in a way. Um, to answer the other part of the question as to, uh, is one not a stepping stone to the other? Quite often it may well be. Um, as somebody progresses on in their career, they would perhaps start as a, as a T, and as they get promoted and move into other activities and sort of take on development activities of, and, and management of program activities, then they start moving more into the professional level experience that I mentioned a, a second ago. Perfect, thanks Kevin. Um, okay, we have a, a question from Nyamdi, and I apologize if I mispronounced your name. Uh, the question is uh, regarding how they can check their eligibility for CRSP or CRST. Um, so for that and for anything eligibility related, I would direct you to the BCRSP website. Uh, there is a bullet point um, uh, chart uh, that is a comparison chart between the two certifications. So you can take a look at uh, the two eligibility requirements side by side to make a determination as to which um, certification you, you are uh, eligible for at this point in time. Okay, and then we have a question from Will. Um, he's asking uh, that there are a variety of prep examination preparation programs and resources available for the CRSP exam. Are there any plans on offering similar resources for the CRST exam? Um, so to that, uh, on the prep course side, uh, all of the prep course providers are independent of the BCRSP. Um, we have no affiliation with any of them other than to list their information on our website as a resource 
uh, to certificates. Um, that being said, I am aware of one prep course provider that is offering a prep course for the CRST already. Um, and, and I would anticipate that in time that will increase. Um, in terms of the resources that we offer, um, the, both the CRSP and the CRST have recommended reference texts uh, cited um, that we would encourage, encourage potential uh, certificates candidates to review and make a determination as to where they perhaps need to focus their areas of study. Um, when it comes to study guides, which we currently publish for the CRSP, um, we are uh, working um, with the CSSC on some uh, exploratory discussions around study guides uh, for both the CRSP and CRST and what they may look like in the future. So more to come on that. I can't, I can't say more than that right now. Okay, and then um, I, we have one uh, other question that it's from Jeff. Um, he's asking uh, about in the US, uh, the BCSP uh, accepts a higher national diploma um, that is WES evaluated for CSP and why don't we accept that? So Jeff, I, to be honest, I'm not quite clear on the question and uh, what you're, you're looking for. Um, and I'm not familiar with that specific diploma that CS, BCSP may accept. I would suggest that you send an email to us um, at info at bcrsp.ca and we can take a look at that for you um, offline because I'm not, I'm not familiar with uh, what they're, they're reviewing. And we have a live question from Steve uh, Newhouse. So Steve, I'm gonna unmute your line for you. And you are unmuted. Steve, are you there? Yep, sorry about that. Just had to follow the Zoom instructions. That's okay. Okay, hey guys, thanks for doing this. It's a great idea. Hopefully we won't lose track of that even after the um, uh, running in circles from the COVID thing is let up. I, it's great to have such an activity we can talk together. So first of all, thanks for that. And the other one I was just going to mention, just thought might be a good one just to do in person and say it. I was glad to hear someone, I, don't, I forget who it was, <clears throat> actually admit that there's a lack of clarity out there in the field, maybe more in the oil and gas. So I do stand correct because I don't work in that profession in Alberta and there are a lot of CRSPs particularly in that but yeah there is a bit of a, <clears throat> a hiccup there where people are not as aware of the CRSP and I'm quite happy with it I think it's a great idea and, and so on and so forth but uh, I, I would agree with you guys on that one that there needs to be a little bit more I don't know if it's education information but yeah, the other people out there, whether they have their peeing or, or some other designation or, or the, uh, I forget what that one always is that the people have that are HR people. There's now two of them. Uh, people is, seem to be much more familiar, though I, you know, kind of understand you're kind of battling with being an accreditation body. You know, you're not really like the CSSE in that way, the membership part, but uh, that would be a real great one. Hopefully you can carry forward that's the point of my raising the hand here uh, forward with these sessions or other ones like how would that be better uh, acknowledged because uh, some are really aware of it I find it seems to be the two schools ones are really aware of it uh, you know pretty well asked for it or the CSP perhaps and then other ones are totally void you can just tell by the job description uh, they don't sometimes don't even mention it Yeah, um, w one thing I will say, I know through the work and our involvement with INCHPO, um, which is the International Network of Safety and Health Professional Organizations. So we are a member, CSSC is a member, and you know our counterparts globally are members. So it's a, a, it's a global collective uh, platform. Um, but one thing that we have talked about at that level, because this issue is a global issue, it is not just an a, in Canada issue, there's under recognition of the safety profession, I would say in almost every jurisdiction. Um, that we have been working on uh, through the OHS capability framework and then through the development of some additional tools um, 
a, a tool, an HR tool, if you will, um, that will help educate HR on how to build a job description for the appropriate level they're looking at. Um, so that is, work is almost um, complete and, and there'll be some more information coming on that that we'll be able to promote. So that's certainly one thing that you know, we can use here in Canada to, to help educate the HR community. Um, but you know, there's lots of other things, of course, that we need to be doing too. I don't know, Monica, do you wanna comment further on Steve's observation? No, I think you've covered it. Thanks so much, Nikki. Perfect. So I, I don't know if that was particularly a, an answer for you, Steve, but I, I think, you know, I don't know that we know the, the exact answer of how we fix that problem. Um, but we are aware of it and we're working on some different things. So yeah. no, it's a good start. Like I said, I'm glad that you guys are pursuing it. But I like that honesty that the person admitted it. sometimes it, it seems to be that that's a bit of a, a hiccup out there. Uh, not always, but I have run into it, and uh, I fully support accreditation all the time for anything, and, and that's why I did pursue it originally, uh, and so I, I definitely trumpet it, but it could, <laughs> you know, as best I can, and, uh, you know, sometimes I have to even bite my tongue when, hopefully I'm not offending any HR people when I'm kind of, you know, with, with them kind of about that or their, or their knowledge of it, so thanks, Nikki. Okay, no problem. Okay, and I have a question from Tim. Uh, Tim is asking, is the safety profession regulated as a profession um, similar to lawyers and engineers in other countries around the world, such as the UK or Australia? Um, so the short answer to, th to that is uh, no. Uh, the only uh, countries where there's any kind of regulation, quasi-regulation um, that we're aware of um, is Singapore, uh, where safety professionals um, must basically be approved by the government. So they have a, a governmental oversight um, on the profession. It's not quite the same as how we would envision licensure. Um, as, as what takes place here, but but it is government oversight and very controlled. Um, there are some things like in the UK, the the CMIOSH term, so the chartered uh, professional term. Um, chartered is uh, a term that is permitted by the government to be used only by certain organizations, um, but beyond that they don't involve themselves in, in regulating or any oversight. So again, you know, there's, there's some uh, nuance there as yes, the government has approved the chartered term, but then it's up to the profession to determine uh, anything else going forward. Um, so so not, not quite to the level of what you would be thinking of in terms of lawyers and engineers where there's a, a college or licensure body that, that oversees the professional practice of individuals in that, in that way and issues licenses to practice. Does anybody, uh, Monica or Dave or Kevin, have anything else to add on that one? Um, it's Dave speaking. I, the only thing I might add to that, that is one of the things that we are uh, pursuing is to get some sort of legal recognition of the profession and it looks like title protection is the place to start so um, you know maybe Canada will be a leader in that area if we're successful uh, okay so um, we have a question from Harry um, he is asking about uh, the application process and our need that one of our two references be completed by a CRSP or equivalent or equivalent and is that not a problem for aspirants from developing nations um, so I can comment on that too I think the the key on that one is the or equivalent um, so for the one of the two references needs to be completed by a CRSP, could be a CSP, could be a CMIOSH, uh, could be a professional engineer, uh, could be a chartered HR professional. Uh, so our definition of You just went dead. 
with Final Body being able to sign off on that reference. Um, Kevin, do you have anything you want to add on that one? No, I think you pretty well covered it. It's, it's basically, yeah, they, it, one of the two reference, referees have to, um, you know, be uh, at a what's considered or generally accepted to be a, a professional level. It, they don't necessarily have to be a CRSP. Okay, and I think uh, we're almost at the, the hour mark, but we have time for this. There's one last question here that we haven't addressed. Um, it's from Marlene. Uh, so to loop back to the question about local meetups, I know the CSC has a regional chapter model where local members arrange meetings and other opportunities for connection, not having to go through the national board, but instead communicating regionally slash locally allows these to occur with much greater frequency. Any thought to facilitating this concept, perhaps through regional slash local chapter leads, of course, post COVID. Uh, so, so Monica, do you want to handle that one? Monica, are you might be muted. Oh, I am back. I don't know what happened. There you go. <laughs> the webinar dropped, so I had to reload it up again. So sorry about that. Oh, so maybe you probably didn't hear the question then. I didn't. <laughs> okay, uh, Dave, can you handle the question? Uh, I'll do my best. Um, okay. I, I, so I'll go on a bit of a limb here, perhaps, but you know, we mentioned earlier in the presentation that we are working closely with CSSE. And uh, I, my hope is that uh, CSSE will offer what we would refer to as member services under a national framework. And if that's the case, then uh, potentially uh, CSSE could head this up and uh, engage the CRSP certificates to uh, meet up uh, in the manner that you're suggesting here. Um, as far as BCRSP doing it alone, um, that we, you know, it's really, I was going to say, it's not really our mandate, nor is it our strength. That That is uh, an area we really believe CSSE can fulfill uh, much better than the BCRSP. Um, Nikki, did, how did I do? Is that, think, a yeah, that was a great answer. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully Marlene agrees and got the answer she was looking for. Uh, so with that being said, we are, uh, as I said, just at the hour mark and there's no other new questions coming in. So I think we uh, can wrap it up for today. Uh, so I do thank everybody for participating on this uh, town hall. Um, if you uh, found it informative and of interest, uh, please share with your uh, certificate colleagues. So uh, when we do another one that they have the opportunity to join in too. And uh, we will, um, as we mentioned earlier, the annual general meeting uh, will be held virtually this year. Uh, so watch for some information coming out on that um, in early May um, on uh, how you might participate virtually in the annual meeting. Thank you uh, and have a, a great uh, afternoon. I think it's afternoon for everybody now or almost. So <laughs> have a great lunch and afternoon if you haven't had your lunch yet. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.